Hey guys, this is Dawson and uh, to my colleagues and classmates in uh, CS625. Today we're going to look at a few types of switches and give you a real world and uh, I have with me um, Nathan Bogan and Nathan is, uh, Nathan how many years experience do you have in this? I've been doing this about 18 years. 18 years, so and he does switching and routing and is very good at that. And so what we wanted to do is, Nathan, I thought we'd start off with the switching types okay. and uh, if you'd just talk about each one of those. Yep, so the three types of switching types we're going to talk about are cut through, store forward, and fragment free. <clears throat> cut through switching is exactly what it says. When the packet's received, um, the only thing that is required to be read in the, in the, in the I'm sorry, the frame. When the frame's received, the only thing that's required to be the read is the destination MAC address. Once the destination MAC address is read, that packet is sent on. It doesn't care if there's any uh, corruption of the packet or of the frame or anything like that. So it doesn't do any checksums. It doesn't validate any of the any of the information within it in the frame. It just sends it to where it's supposed to go. It lets the other end decide whether or not it's a valid frame or not. Store and forward, on the other hand, receives the entire frame and validates the integrity of the frame against the checksum at the end of the frame. So this creates a little bit more, well, quite a bit more latency here than it does here. Obviously, as soon as the MAC address is received, this packet or frame is shot out. In this instance here, the entire frame is received, buffered, checked, and then sent on its way. Um, this is a little bit more um, better a process when you have a large number of access control lists within the switch or security measures within the switch that have to be checked against because when you buffer this all that information is read to begin with. Okay, Nathan, we, we had I guess in our textbook or notes, lecture notes, had understood that fragment free is kind of a compromise between those two. Correct, absolutely. So fragment free is kind of in between um, and it actually reads 64 bits of the frame before it's allowed to be sent down the, down the wire. Um, and the actual reasoning behind fragment free is to determine whether or not um, they have a collision free environment to forward that frame out on before it sends the frame down the line. And is that predominantly what's used today? Um, actually cut through is the, is, the, is the desired process. Okay, so cut through is used more than the other two. Correct. Let's go over to types of switches and you'll see that Nathan's got several switches lined up here for you so we could actually show you the various types of switches. So Nathan, uh, let's just take a look at the top switch. As you know okay. here on the board, if, if you notice, we'll have managed and unmanaged switches. So why don't you just briefly touch on those first and then we'll come down and show the actual switches okay. itself. So the difference between managed and unmanaged, a managed switch you actually apply an IP address to and you can access that switch remotely or from within the network to change settings within the switching environment per port or um, globally within the, within the device. Unmanaged is exactly what it says. It's a dumb device. Um, you get, if you got an eight port switch, you've got eight ports and when you plug it in, that's it. It's up and running. There's no configuration. There's no management. Um, there's no changes to do with inside the switch. It's but just but predominantly, on. you would say that in a in a home or may, maybe very small office, you might use an unmanaged switch. Correct. But in any kind of business of any size, they're all going to be managed switches. Correct? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You want an enterprise or, or a, a, a similar type device to go within a corporation or a business. And unmanaged switches is absolutely a small office, home office environment. Okay, now let's go to fixed port, and I think you have a couple of okay. fixed port switches right, right, yep. right there. So um, in our fixed port switches, this is an eight port switch. Um, it does have some modular expansion ability, but this is typically what we consider um, fixed ports. Here as well as a, a 48 port switch. Fixed ports meaning that all the ports reside within the switch. You can't remove them, replace them, fix them, or, or do anything to them. And I noticed there's some, some little connections uh, to each side of the normal ports, Correct. Ethernet ports. Yeah, so these are SFPs. Um, these are today's uh, small modules, what they call small form factor. Um, this will allow us to, to uh, put in a fiber interface or a, a gigabit copper interface into uplink. These are considered uplink ports now. Um, as you can see, this one here 
has actually a copper and, a, and an SFP slot, so it's one or the other. So if I, pop, I put a SFP in here, um, I can't use the copper. And form. SFP being? Small form factor. Small form factor. Okay. Now, the, the, the second switch, uh, I think, is also known as a stackable switch, which was Correct. our next thing on the list. So Did you turn that around and yeah, show in order it? to stack this switch, you would have to come from here to another to another device. In this situation here, this this top switch has stacking modules built into it, and um, they will stack to another switch with the similar stacking modules. And there's a cable that plugs in, more like a firewire type device, cable, very short in length. Um, limitations on on distance uh, between these devices. But um, these are 32 gig backplanes. So if I've got 48 gig coming in here and I got a 32 gig backplane up and I can put two of these to another set of switches for redundancy, um, when they say 32 gig backplane, it's actually what they call 64 full duplex. So it's 32 gig both directions. Ah, so, so that's very similar to like a parallel port, isn't it? Correct. Okay, so basically your bus, if you will, your it bus. is 64, 32 gig in each direction, correct? correct? And I would assume if we had a lot of stacks of these, you would go from stack one to stack two, I meant from stack two to stack one on one, and then you'd go from that stack two to stack one on the next and right. on and on. And how many can you stack of these? Eight. Eight, okay. And then on the eighth one, you come out of two back into um, one on one the on other the end. top switch. Correct? Gotcha. Yeah, so you can actually disconnect um, a switch in the middle of the stack and remove it, and because of that redundancy or that, that secondary path, um, the whole stack will not go down. Just that one switch will be out of service. Okay, so that's a stackable switch. And now I guess the next switch you have here is a, let's just set that one off to the side. Yeah, this is, this is as close as I can get to a modular switch. This is actually an older switch. Um, what, what I'd like to have seen is this bay right here replicated across these bays here several times. Um, and in a modular switch, you can actually take out the dust covers and insert however, however many ports or different types of ports uh, come on the modules for that individual switch. So here I could have 10 gig ports. Here I could have uh, gigabit ethernet. Here I could have fiber ports. Here I could have copper ports. So, uh, uh, so and, and also that would say something to the scalability. Uh, in other words, I may pay a little more for a modular switch than a fixed port Correct. switch, but I've got the ability to grow very easily just by plugging in the appropriate card. Correct. Okay. Absolutely. All right. And so is that switch, by the way, is our modular switches also stackable? Do they make stackable modular switches? Um, yeah, I mean, in this instance, you can actually stack via the front because you've got 10 gig ports up front. I don't think that uh, they're getting with the back plane stack okay. like, the, like the 3750s here. Okay, now let's go down and uh, we went from uh, fixed to stackable to modular and now we're looking at a chassis switch. And What really defines the difference, Nathan, between a chassis switch and uh, any other modular switch or anything <clears throat> else? Well, a chassis switch um, basically is a back plane, back plane bus within a box. Um, and we have the ability to change the brains out of the switching fabric of, of the chassis out. So you can upgrade your brains of the switch or the switching fabric by removing this module, downing the switch, removing this module, and replacing it with a newer one um, that has more advanced features. It also gives us the ability to change up the types of media that we have within the switch based on our, our closet requirements. Um, here in this case, we've got um, two. Uh, 48 port modules, looks like power over ethernet blades. Uh, each one of these are a blade, they just pop out. And down here at the bottom, we have a uh, fiber module. Uh, so <clears throat> because of the density of fiber, if we had more than what we have here, we could actually add another module, um, scoot these two up and add another fiber module. So it gives us some flexibility within the closet to collapse everything into the core. And uh, you may even you know, put your servers off, in, off into the core here. But again, the, the big thing is we have redundant power supplies, we have redundant fans, there's a fan module in this right here. Um, okay, this, this so, removable. so let me make sure I understand. Basically, this switch would sit in our data center, mm -hmm. and out of each one of these 48 ports here, we, we would then go Ethernet, depending, let's just say Cat5e or Cat6, we would be connected to another switch in a closet. 
Well, with the, with, I would generally use uh, fiber to go out to the, to the closets, but the copper can actually extend out. If you've got a gig port, you can extend uh, copper out to the closet. These would be primarily to uh, collapse server farms into or, or users ah. that, are, that are hardwired back to the... I got gotcha. you. So these would be used for your connectivity to your server, your mm -hmm. router, your firewall, etc. And then so you would go fiber out of this fiber uh, board chassis. Mm -hmm. You would go up the closet. It would connect into a panel. That panel then would connect to each certain run out to various outlets. Correct. And uh, I guess one other kind of a question is, would I use one port or two ports if I'm using VOIP? Voice over IP, you'd use one port. I'd use one port. So that port would go from there to the phone, and then I would connect the phone to the uh, PC, PC or, or desktop laptop. device. Correct. Okay, let's just cover a couple of more things up here on the board. I guess one of them is, uh, uh, well, we just covered connectivity. That was kind of the mm -hmm. idea there. Let's talk about centralized control and what that means in the management of, of switches, Nathan. Okay. Well, centralized control uh, can mean a couple different things in the switching world now. With the 3750s that actually stack down the back plane. Um, those eight switches are individual boxes. They have a back plane stacking mechanism. Um, but when they're stacked together, they are one device. So I use one IP. And I can see, I can tell that into or log into the top switch, and I can see every port to the bottom, to port to the switch eight at the bottom. So it's it, that's kind of a uh, in-house centralized management process, so I can manage the entire stack from one connection. Um, in this situation right here, centralized management is the is the processor that we have up here. Uh, I log into it, and I can see all the switches within the chassis. Um, there's also software and applications that you can use um, in a Cisco environment. It's called Cisco Works. It actually goes out and monitors the health of the switches and will allow you to do upgrades, push up, push out configs from, from one location versus if you have 1,200 branches touching every device um, within that network. Okay, just, uh, just a couple of other questions here <laughs> as we wrap up. Uh, first of all, I guess when you're managing these switches, you can basically, if you configure it right and have the appropriate, uh, like you said, stackable switches in the closet in this switch, you could want from one device completely centrally manage all of your switching requirements, correct? Correct. And just to let me check, I, I, I read in the book where it said that basically when you set up a switch, you really don't go in and manage it to each port. It kind of has its own self-learning tool. It learns what's connected to what. First time it broadcasts out much like a hub. Right. And then it, as it gets information, it puts that into its, uh, I guess, switch table. Yeah. And uh, once it ha goes into the switch table, then from then on it only sends that particular device the message. Is that correct? Correct. And that's, uh, that really this starts getting into... Um your ARP and address resolution protocols and uh, your MAC tables within the switch, your forwarding tables within the switch. Um, those are built and learned each time a request is sent out and the device doesn't know where it lives, it broadcasts it. Once it receives that information back from a certain path, it memorizes that path, puts it in its table. So the next time, instead of sending out the request or the broadcast for that uh, location, it knows to send it out port 48 to get to another switch to get to the end device. One other one other question for you, and we'll we'll wrap it up with this. Any other thing about switching and routing, but sp certainly switching, since that's the topic for the day that you'd like to share with the class? Things they need to be aware of when they design that kind of thing. Spanning tree. It's the most important thing in switching, and basically, spanning tree is a process where um, when you power all of them on and start plugging them in together. Um, that's where it actually starts. It's the, the four processes of spanning tree are blocking, listening, learning, and forwarding. So <clears throat> if you turn spanning tree off, which you can uh, on a switch, and you plug a switch into another switch and plug that switch back into the main switch again, you've created a network loop. And that will, that will basically bring your network to, to its knees. You won't be able to print, you won't be able to access servers, you won't be able to access the internet. And basically those packets just spin in that circle and they keep accumulating and, and recreating themselves um, without spanning tree. Spanning tree looks, it, it blocks, listens, learns, and if it receives a packet back on, the, on, a, on a, uh, a different port than when it sent the packet out on, 
uh, it'll actually block those ports and won't allow them to become active to block the, the loop. Okay. So. Well, guys, we've uh, Nathan. We certainly appreciate you uh, here at DCI, and, and as uh, both an employee and colleague, and we certainly appreciate you taking the time today to go over the types of switching and just a few ideas about switching. Thank you.